All right, guys, um, so, sorry for the delay. Um, let's get started. Um, today, um, we're gonna talk about um, using data science uh, to solve telecom problems. And we talk about uh, churn prediction, uh, in particular in telecoms. Um, and uh, within that, we'll discuss um, the classification problems. Okay. So first, a few words about telecom industry, right? I mean, we're um, dealing with the telecoms um, on a daily basis. You know, our phones, our internet, it's all provided uh, by telecom services. Um, so, you know, if you want to sort of classify what uh, telecom services are, it's good to look into, on one hand, uh, you know, how the services are being provided, and on the other side is, uh, you know, to who. So, you know, the, the good description is, of course, it's the wireless services, like mobile services, or it is a wireline fixed services. Typically, you know, in home um, or in office, we'll have a lot of wired services, but each of us has, of course, mobile phones. And um, who get those services? Well, it's a consumer and uh, businesses, right? And for consumer fixed phones, it's cable TV, it's home internet. Uh, for businesses, it's mostly, of course, corporate data, but also all kind of, you know, uh, voice over IP, network security, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, quite often uh, in, in, in the case of the uh, businesses, employee also have uh, you know, voice plans for, for their phones. But overall, for the telecoms, the major, major profit coming, you know, the, the, the biggest profit coming from wireless consumer services, right? This is a major source of profit, and that's um, what we'll be focusing on. Um, it is the mobile plans, right? Um, that telecoms always sort of tweaking and twisting, um, you know, sometimes um, creating bundles, um, putting all kind of limits on the amount of data you can uh, use and, and, and charging you for any possible sort of add-on sort of bells and whistles. And the reason for that is because again, this is a major, um, you know, source of profit for the, for the mobile industry. Now, it's also worth noting that, um, you know, in fact, today telecom is really, uh, is, is in the center of the entire ecosystem um, where that provides us, uh, provides a customer, um, you know, with different connectivities and here examples of, of uh, you know, various network operators that do this for us. And in Russia, it's of course, you know, um, MTS, Megaphone, the line. Uh, but then there are, of course, device manufacturers, those that give us devices, provide us devices, um, and uh, content providers. Now, and that's a quite a big play right now uh, um, in terms of content providers. Um, the fact that a lot of um, information now is, is being delivered through so-called OTT services, so over-the-top services. Um, which, which really sort of Netflix uh, or Disney or those type of um, streaming services that go on top of our wireless um, network. So uh, switching to analytical problems um, and, and sort of data science type of use cases um, that we can do um, within the telco operators, um, we can probably distinguish this, them in, in the two, into two classes, right? One is, I would call it sort of a backend, which is a network operations. And over there, um, the use cases can be, and here they were the right side of the, of the uh, table. Um, it can be you know, a lot of technical use cases, like for example, predictive maintenance, when you, can want, when you want to predict um, the quality of of uh, network um, and you know, potential failures. Um, then there are, of course, you know, location of towers, geo kind of analytics problems, then, uh, you know, different ways to solve the technical challenges. And there is a field work 
so which is you know sending the repair people um, and, and help them with logistics and um, you know with resolution of the problems. Uh, so there are a lot of things you do to keep the technology um, running. Now, at the same time, um, you know the, the focus, the big focus is of course on the customer operations because it's you know customers that pay money, and uh, um, over there um, you might also think about different use cases starting from you know um, you know order entry, which is like okay how you order service provisioning, it's how a service is being set up for you, right? A lot of interesting use cases possible there. Then of course you know billing um how to how to correctly bill and what analytics we can do from there and uh, probably the, the, the most central is a customer care um or customer services where um there are sort of agents uh helping you to switch you know plans to the payments to um you know in, interact with um with the system literally and uh, um, that's where a lot of innovation is happening right now with ChatGPT, for example, being brought in um, as to, to improve um, the chatbots, but also all kind of um, interesting um, automation possible there in terms of, for example, analysis of the feedback, um, you know, sentiment analysis uh, from the customers. And a very, 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 very important use case um, that we're gonna talk about today is of course a churn prediction. So taking care of customer churn um, within the operators. So in order to understand the importance of the churn is, you know, let's look at very quick sort of economics. Um, we can take an example of Verizon. Uh, which is one of the largest U.S. Uh, cell phone pro uh, mobile operator, and um, it actually has uh, more than 100 million. It has 114 million uh, customers, right? Uh, so you know, probably every third person in, in the U.S. Um, looking at these numbers, almost every third person has a Verizon. Um, and uh, within the customers, there is within the retail customers. Uh, and retail means again a direct to consumer, as we discussed previous on a previous lecture. Um, like 92 millions are uh, postpaid customers, which is uh, they are on a uh, plan, right? And you're paying um, at the end at the end of the month. And the you know, majority of uh, mobile operators prefer that compared to prepaid customers uh, because of the sort of amount of services you can sell to the postpaid customers. And so the revenue uh, from only for, for, for Verizon from wireless is around 100 billion a year, which is a lot. Now, typically operators uh, use the metric which is called ARPU or ARPA. Um, it's average revenue per use, per user or um, average revenue per account. Um, you know, because sometimes there are multiple users on the same account. And so, for example, for Verizon, this number is 130 bucks a month, which makes it more than $1,000 a year. So users bring lots of money, right? Now, if we think about the churn rate, now the churn rates for operators, mobile operators is not very high. Um, it can be like, you know, several percentage point, several percent. Um, uh, you know, the, the market, for example, or US, or if you think Russia or Europe, it's very much saturated. So it's, uh, you know, almost everybody have a phone and it's only when sort of, you know, younger people growing up, kids growing up and getting the phone or maybe migration and getting a phone. Um, or you switching operators, right? Going from one operator to another. Um, so that's you know how you, on one hand, gain people, on the other hand, you lose people. Now, but if you think about this, um, you know, even with 1.5 percent um, churn rate, um, let's say it's an average churn rate, uh, it, 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 within a year, having a hundred more than 100 million uh, customers, you know, one percent of that is almost a million customers a year, right? 
and million customers is uh, you know with the revenue with ARPU hundred bucks a month, it actually reaches to a billion dollars of a loss. And so since this is a customers that are living, some of course of of this you know customer living are not preventable, like for example, you know people die or people relocate. But others cases, like for example, switching of mobile operator is preventable. And so of course, in spite of the fact that churn, according to, uh, you know, compared to sort of churn in other industries in mobile operators pretty low, it's still a very big problem. And so being able to prevent churn is, um, you know, sort of, it is a constant fight for mobile operators, especially in a saturated markets when the growth um, is, is limited, customer acquisition is limited. But um, that's the sort of churn modeling is not is important not only for um, telecoms, I mean, pretty much um, any other service sector deals with, with, with churn, right? The service is, is service sector is, uh, you know, when we, when the, the, the production uh, of the, we see a production of services, not not the products, but it is kind of, it's most of, of the time it's sort of retail services, which is given directly to the customers, and especially um, that's important because within services you often have a very competitive landscape and um, pretty high customer acquisition costs. You know, to 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 get somebody from a customer it usually costs money. Um, you. The other reason is, you know, services usually operate on the subscription plans. And when you have a subscription plans, it's repetitive interaction, right? And so um, like telecoms, uh, you know, you've been, you know, they, they pretty much bring um, you know, revenue every month. And, um, you know, in, in, in this kind of services, there's usually pretty large customer LTV. We talked about the LTV last time. So, you know, the, the, Typically, the churn management or churn prediction is, is, is really important for, first of all, telecommunication, telecoms, and then for, of course, financial services like banking or insurance or investment, where there is always sort of competitors ready to take over um, the client. And, you know, quality of the services, quality of the services offered are usually quite comparable with sort of some nuances. So if we look at the churn, and this is also sort of from open source public data, this is for Verizon. Um, if you notice churn, you know, fewer it's measured um, uh, per quarter, right? And, uh, but you can, you know, discuss churn per month or churn per year. Um, sometimes people talk about, you know, attrition or customer turnover, customer attrition, it's all the same. Um, so, you know, if you notice Verizon, you know, have, has been having some problems in, in the last year with churn um, significantly increasing. And just to give you perspective, that really, um, you know, what happens then with, with a market share, right? So market share drops because the churn means, you know, customers leaking out, customers leaving the service um, and, you um, if uh, you know customer acquisition is is slower than the churn, right? You know the operator losing market share, and that's already becoming pretty big deal. So as we uh, discussed, you know, looking at the number of of accounts, you know, Verizon pretty much um, takes like every third customer, every third citizen of U.S. for example have Verizon services, right? So market share was thirty percent. In, in you know in, in um, 2020 and it dropped now and again maybe it's just one percent but remembering that it is hundred and, and and whatever was it 120 million users one percent that's a lot so now um what can we do in terms of um customer churn if there is any way to prevent it of course, there are ways to prevent it, but first of all, um, you need to understand, uh, you know, who is going to be churning out, and you know, is it possible by by looking at the data to actually predict that the customer will churn? 
And, uh, you know, in fact, it is. Um, this is just simple example from one of the data sets where, um, you know, with a box plot, we're looking at, uh, you know, customers who churn out versus not churn um, based on just a few <clears throat> metrics that you can have. And um, looking at, at these metrics, you, you easily see that, um, for example, you know, tenure, you know, on average, um, longer tenure um, actually signifies, you know, that the, the customer will not churn, right? Um, at the same time, you know, depending on the high monthly charges, will tell you that the customer might more likely will 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 churn. So, so there are some signals in the data that might allow us to um, predict um, the churn. Now, why do we want to predict? Well, because really, um, you know, the the ways to fight churn is like the, the, the sort of the best way to fight churn is you know offering discounts but um offering discount to every you know single person out of you know 100 million uh, users even you offer a discount by one dollar per month you're losing a million bucks a month all right so it doesn't really make a lot of sense um so then the question becomes is okay can we and, and then dollar discount will not, you know, prevent somebody from churning out. So discount should be much more significant. So you cannot offer the, those discount to everybody. So we need to be able to detect who will most likely leave and offer discounts to them. At the same time, you probably want to balance that with computing LTV for the customers who are going to leave because again, if the LTV is small, then probably you might, maybe you will not even want to keep this customer and let him go um, if if uh, long-term value is, is lower. Um, but yes, there are different ways, uh, you know, people trying to reduce, uh, operators trying to reduce churn. First of all, through um, um, discounts, um, you know, then there's sometimes if it's, for example, you know, if it is uh, up, you, the, the cable operator or sort of movie channels, subscription services, then most likely you could pose a subscription um, and, then, and then, you know, offer some bundles for the discounted price. And, you know, in the simplest case, sort of using customer support to make a call or emailing, um, to, to the trace customers. But pretty much for any of these measurements to be efficient um, and effective, you need, they, they need to be addressed to people who are likely to churn, right? If, you're, if the customer is not likely to churn and they're getting an email from customer service, like saying like, hey, you know, we think, um, you know, if they're just offering some discounts, okay, this is great, but if they say, you know, if they, if they say that we think you're gonna churn, that's gonna just put that piece customers off so um for for this met for this methods to work you need to be able to identify who's going to churn right and that's where analytics come in and that's sort of what we're going to be talking about today and that's you know part of your homework is to build a churn predictive model so you know churn is really about customers you know will leave or will not leave so it's a classification problem we literally need to take um, you know the history of the customers and based on the history of of you know uh, the, the customer you know, calls interaction with the service etc predict if they're gonna leave or not right so classify them into sort of potential churners or not churners and so this classification algorithm and so we're going to talk for a little bit about um various classification algorithms that are available so, you know, when we talk about classification, we can think about you know, either binary classification where we um, split um, everything in two classes, sort of, uh, you know, yes or no, positive or negative, or it can be a multi-class classification. Um, and the results can be either, um, you know, class assignments or uh, what's used more in practice is uh, probability uh, to, for, for, for um, 
point for to belong to a particular class. Um, it's a probability or score or ranking, um, and this is called ranking classifiers. We're going to look at them today. Now, majority of the classifiers, though, there is of course a, a possibility to build um, classifiers that are multi-class, so splitting into into multiple classes. Very often, we deal with binary classifiers in in, in practice. So examples is you know logistic regression, uh, those called regression is actually a classifier. Decision tree algorithm, KNN, which is K nearest neighbors, and all kind of um, ensemble methods where, for example, you know, you, you took um, like the most famous is random forest and gradient, gradient boosting decision trees um, that are built on top of the decision tree approaches. And of course, there are like neural networks, deep learning um, algorithms. So you know, let's start with logistic regression, um, and we're going to, you know, use this illustration a lot today. So I want to kind of spend a little bit of time um, on, on on this example. So let's say um, we have a, uh, you know, we have we have a following problem. Um, we want to predict if the student is going to pass exam or not, depending on how many hours um, the student has uh, studied. And um, here is the data that is available. So path or not pass, um, this is zero or one, right? It's sort of binary decision. So this is pass, this is fail, All right? This is fail, no pass. And uh, um, the hours, the hours that we have here is, um, excuse me. The hours that we have here are are shown. Let's say you know um, if the, and this is our test data, right? And we, we can you know again look. At, this is our entire data. We can think about the test and train, um, train and test data. So if um, somebody you know spent let's say one hour failed, you know less than one hour failed, um, you know one and a half failed, two failed, you know three failed. For example, here. At the same time, we have another examples where, um, of course, when there is like you know five hours um, of five hours or six hours studying. Um, oops, actually, I'm sorry, I probably confused this. Um, that's probably yeah. Let's make it fail. Let's make it bust. Um, and and so when there are like five hours of studies, uh, exams being you, know, you pass exam when when there are four hours of studies pass exam etc. So, um, you know this is like very very clear sort of separation, right? You can say okay, well, you know if if um, you know there is a um, say the threshold is if we ignore these points and and maybe you know some of these points we can say okay if the threshold is right here, like then everything to the right everything that more than three hours of work. Uh, student will pass and below three hours will fail. But we do have other examples. We do have examples where somebody actually studied only for two hours and still, you know, passed an exam or maybe maybe like, you know, um, two and a half hours, right, and passed the exam. And then we had somebody who started studied, um, you know, a little bit less and one person passed the exam and the other failed. Right, and then we had somebody who actually studied for three and a half hours and still failed the exam, right? Because this is a fail, and this is, a, and, and this is a pass. So uh, life is not very clear, right? So there is no sort of clear, um, uh, you know, threshold that will easily separate um, this into uh, fail and pass. So we want to build then a model, and um, you know. Let's think about this as a regression problem for a second, right? Where you build a regression model, um, and uh, you know, regression means we want to approximate with this with some sort of you know function um, where we have points um, with the values zeros and ones. And of course, we can try to approximate this with a straight line, right? But if we do it with a straight line, um, 
you realize that the, the sort of the, the error that we're making, right? This is all this distance. This is an error that we're making here, right? On, in terms of our data points. So this is probably not a good approximation. We could of course try to approximate it with some sort of step function as we discussed before, but then um, we are making significant error, uh, you know, right here for these points and we're making significant error for these points. So, which actually leaves us an opportunity to, um, and leaves us with a choice of approximating with some sort of curved line um, that we show here um, in, on, on this blue. And, um, the, you know, again, the same way as we did with traditional regression, we can calculate, you know, errors, which are these distances, right, from the data points to the curve. And um, that will be our sort of error in terms of calculations. Um, but we can show that um, this is, you know, definitely less than if we say approximated with a straight line. And the good news here is that um, if we use a particular function and the particular function is called logistic regression. And so this is a function that um, this line is being described by. Um, and we can calculate um, these coefficients, right? Um, then the value of these functions can be interpreted as a probability. And so then what we see here is um, on the on the vertical axis, right? Um, we can actually interpret this as a probability of passing the exam. And so if somebody studied for two hours, then he has a probability to pass, you know, twenty five percent chance of passing the exam. Um, if we if somebody studied for, I don't know, let's say two and a half hours, they have like forty percent chance to pass the exam. And somebody studied for four hours they will have probably what, like 80%, 80% chance of, of um, uh, passing the exam. So um, instead of just a binary class pass or fail, we have a, um, we have a uh, you know, classifier that tells us uh, the, the probabilities to pass and fail. And then when we have those probabilities, we can of course convert them back to you know binary classification by saying like okay well if the probability is greater than 50 percent say for example um, we're gonna say it is we're predicting the class pass is probability is less than 50 percent we're predicting the class fail so here we're taking the probability and we're converting it into a hard assignment into classes pass or fail so in some sense um, what we're trying, what we're doing with that is we're saying, okay, so here is a threshold, right? And everything above the threshold will be calling uh, pass and everything below threshold will be calling fail. And this is our sort of, uh, you know, classifier, um, the classifier function. Um, so though it is called regression and, and, you know, the reason it's called regression because we sort of started from regression, but in fact, it's logistic regression. This is the name of the function, and it's a classifier that gives us probabilities of uh, you know classes. And then we're introducing a threshold, and based on a threshold, uh, we assign um, points to a class. So uh, if we get you know a new data point, let's so say that many hours of studying we can clearly see that, okay, then the probability of passing will be, you know, 20%. And according to say this rule, if it is 20%, then it, we will classify it as a fail. Or if somebody studies, you know, four hours, probability to pass will be 80% and classify it as pass. Now, this is very important picture, um, an example, because later on we'll, look at it and uh, how to use this um, type of classifiers uh, to actually uh, to, you know, to evaluate um, the results of, of, of the classifiers. Um, it's called again, um, typically this, this is a probabilistic solution, um, but quite similar 
if the curve is not probabilistic, um, but we still can sort of get some ranking. It's called ranking classifier. Okay, so that's one example. Moving forward, the, the most sort of classical type of, of uh, you know, classifier is our decision tree, of course. Um, and within the decision tree, we uh, um, have, uh, you know, we build a tree uh, based on the data that is given to us. And uh, in, in that tree, there are sort of decision nodes that are based on features, um, decide where you, you need to go, say, to the left or to the right. And there are leaf nodes that contains um, class that we want to classify. Um, and for example, on the picture to the right, um, we have data points and um, you know, using uh, the decision tree algorithm, we create this tree. And then based on that data points, um, our, you know, our data points are, are, are split across um, different nodes of the tree. And if you notice here, kind of the idea of, of this um, algorithm is, you know, you, you have here an example, we have multiple data points and there are different colors. And so we expect the classifier to classify based on the sort of some features into different buckets. And if you notice, for example, here we got all, um, all nodes of green color. So this bucket will be sort of 100% sort of probability that if um, we take a new point and it's being sort of following this branch of the tree end up in that bucket, in that leaf, it will be green. Um, but for example, this one uh, has a mixture of, of black and, and green. And so um, that can be like 50-50 or ending up in this um, can probably have its three to one, right? Probability. So it's, it can be 60% of, you know, 80% probability of, of yellow and 20% and, and of, of green color. So you can also, even with the decision tree, you can still have a probabilistic interpretation of, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the decision, right, or the type of um, the class um, then you can be classified into. So, um, and, and then random forest, well, the random forest, uh, you know, we're going to talk about random forest algorithm, that's actually, it's built on trees, and um, the idea is very simple, so you, you do, in, in a certain way, split the, the data set and split the features that you create for this data set, um, and you train multiple trees, each of them you train on a subset of features and on a subset of data. And so you get very different trees because, well, you can get, you can get different trees because um, each tree doesn't see all the data and doesn't see all the features. And then um, when you want to classify an item, you actually send it through all the trees and each tree uh, will give you a decision to which class your item belongs to. And then, what you can do is you can vote, and literally it's just sort of majority voting. And so here there are both, you know, we have like out of four trees to assign um, your data point to class C. So majority voting uh, is C, and so final class will be C. So in fact, random forest one was probably the most robust algorithms that we have currently in, in our sort of machine learning tools. Tool set, it's random forest or gradient boosting decision trees. Gradient boosting decision trees, it's an also algorithm that is based on um, trees, uh, but you know, it's it sort of has slightly different approach internally, but ultimately it also does um, some sort of voting internally. Okay. So now um, when we understand how those algorithm works. Um, let's talk about training and testing. And this is probably, you know, the most critical part within um, the algorithm development and within, within the supervised learning algorithm development, simply because, you, you know, you're going to take and you will take the algorithm out of the box. So you're not going to change anything within the algorithm, but you need to make sure you understand how those algorithms actually work.
because um, that's sort of the, the critical part here. So um, within the, you know, we talked previously that uh, when you take, when you have your data, you, you split it into the train and test, and then you do, for example, uh, cross-validation, um, where, where you have different faults on, on, on some of them you train and others you test. And um, depending on uh, you know, the, the, the model complexity, you can actually um, make it such a way that on a training data set, uh, you get very small error on a test, but the test sample test error will be decreasing. But at some moment when the model complexity will be too large, the test error will increase. And so in some sense, when you're building those algorithms and trying them, you know, you want to find the sort of the sweet spot where um, the error on the test set is the smallest. That's usually your best sort of um, guess in terms of the algorithm parameters, like for example, the depth of the tree um, that, that you're using. Now, for some for some algorithms, you actually don't have a lot of a lot of parameters that you can tune up, like logistic regression, but for you know, for trees, you do. Um, so, but how do you evaluate the algorithms? Well, um, with the, let's let's focus right now on a binary um, algorithms, binary scenario, because uh, you know th that that you can sort of you can actually generalize this to uh, more options, but you know the, the essence does not change, and majority again of the. Uh, majority of the use cases you will be doing, they are um, binary. So um, the idea is uh, to look at this was so-called confusion matrix, where um, we, we compare the outcome of the algorithm with the actual sort of class of the event. And remember, for the test data, we know sort of the, the correct answer, right? And so true positive is where we say the event is going to happen and it actually happens. So when you know, we predict the correct class, right? And um, when true negative, it's also when we say the event doesn't happen and it doesn't happen, that event will not happen and doesn't happen. And so these two cases is when we predict correct classes, right? We say it's going to be negative and it is negative. We say it's going to be positive and it is positive. Um, and then um, there are two sort of scenarios where we, when the algorithm make mistakes. Uh, one scenario is when we predict that something is going to happen, but in reality, it, you know, it didn't happen. Um, say, you know, we're predicting it's going to be raining and it doesn't rain. Or um, other way around, which is false, false negative, we're predicting that there will be no rain, but it actually um, does rain, right? Um, so based on that, we can actually calculate, you know, the simplest metric, which is called accuracy um, of our um, algorithm. And, um, you know, the, that sort of very intuitive metric, which says, okay, let's just see all the cases when our algorithm is correct um, and divide by, you know, the total number of data points. So here is how many data points we classify correctly and overall total number of data points. And so that is the quality of our, our, our algorithm. So it sounds like you know, very good idea. So you know, accuracy is um, to use accuracy. Now, unfortunately, things are not that simple. And um, I want to give you an example. Um, this is of course sort of, you know, kind of artificial example, but I think it's, it's, it's uh, sort of, it can help us to understand the, the, the problem with accuracy. And, and the problem is the following. Let's uh, assume that we have what's so-called majority class classifier. So majority class classifier means the following. Doesn't really matter what, we always classify our data point as positive, okay? So if we, we don't look at the features, we just always say, okay, it's positive. All right, let's see what's going to happen. Imagine that we have a data set where we have 50% points are negative and 50% uh, points are positive. 
right? So that's our sort of data set. Then this algorithm, since we will say all of those points, you know, since we always say it's positive, right? We will be correct in 50% of the cases. So, right, so this is, will be, you know, will be correct here. And we'll make mistake on 50% uh, of other cases, but, you know, in numerator it's 50%. So the accuracy will be 0.5, right? Which is really means we, we're guessing, right? Okay, but what happens if we change the data set? In our data set, we'll have 90% of positive examples and 10% of negative. All of a sudden, having exactly the same algorithm, which is calling everything positive, we'll end up with accuracy being 0.9, which is very strange, right? Because we thought that um, the accuracy is a metric of an algorithm, but it looks like it's actually a metric of not just an algorithm, but a combination of algorithm and uh, the data set. Well, in fact, it's a metric of combination of algorithm and how balanced the data set is. So it actually works well, accuracy as a metric works well when you have a balanced data set, which we have here, where the number of positive examples is um, equal or similar to the number of negative examples. But when the data set is not balanced, where one class is, is, is much larger than the other, um, the metric doesn't work well. Right and uh, you know accuracy point which is nine percent. You know it's 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 kind of strange if our algorithm always calls everything positive. Um, in fact, this is a scenario, this type of a scenario where data sets are unbalanced, are most interested interesting cases in in, in business because again, if we say uh, if we look into customers um, that the churn modeling, then um, you know as you said the, the percentage of short is like 1%, right? And uh, um, everything else is, is not short. And so the, the data set is very, very unbalanced. And, and then by the way, this very simple classifier, if we just measure it by accuracy, like the very simple classifier that says everybody is not gonna churn, we'll actually have 99% accuracy in the churn modeling problem. But it's not gonna do any, any good for us because uh, you know this is, a, dumb classifier, it just says nobody's gonna churn. So uh, that tells us that the, there is a problem with this metric, right? And we need to use other metrics, some other metric to actually um, work with imbalanced classes. And, uh, you know, for any other sort of classes. And the idea here is, is simple, um, you know, we need to reduce this imbalance. Um, and to do that, we actually, instead of just using it, and we do it very often, by the way, in, in, in many problems, instead of actually using the absolute values, right? We're gonna use relative values. And so instead of using, um, you know, true positives, number of true positives, we'll introduce the notion of rates. And um, we're gonna talk about true positive rate, which is a ratio of true positive to all number of positives. So it is, ratio of this to all number of positives and uh, uh, false positive rate, which is uh, um, ratio of false positives to all number of negatives. So the all negatives that are there. Um, since we do this, um, now we, we make it relative, we can actually using those two numbers, F to P TPR and FPR, um, we can calculate both this and that if we need to. Um, but uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily you know, need to do this. Typically those two numbers that enough to characterize your um, your algorithm, right? Your classification algorithm. And again, because you can derive pretty much every other number from those two. And of course you can express accuracy using um, this, this metric through TPR and FPR and introducing back um, 
um, the numbers. And by seeing, the, by, by looking at this, you realize that yes, really because um, there's a range of negatives, uh, even the classes are balanced. And, and so the number of positives and negatives are equal, um, then, um, you know, literally we, we, we see that the contribution of each of them is equal. But if the balance shifts, you know, accuracy really depends on the balance and positive and negative classes. So having said all that, uh, the bottom line is to characterize algorithms, we use two numbers, true positive rate and false positive rate, which is the ratio of number of true positives, which is the correct predictions of the positive class to the total number of positives, and uh, the ratio of uh, false positives, which is a, you know predicting that something is positive while it is not, divided by the total number of all negatives. Now it might be confusing at the beginning, but it's sort of it's one of those things you kind of getting used to. So. Since there are two numbers that we use, um, we can always, uh, you know, plot them on the, you know, on the diagram where one axis is, you know, the pulse, the our false positive rate, and our our is true positive rate. So again, to think about this um, false positive rate, what is it? What is it? Well, it is our sort of false alarm rate, right? Saying that. It is a fire, but there is no fire, right? And true positive rate is, you know, the true identification. And so algorithms uh, based on their metric, right? False positive rate, true positive rate, and here like a few examples, they can be placed on this two by two matrix, uh, you know, on, the, on this diagram in different spots, right? So for example, an algorithm that sits somewhere here, it has, uh, you know, uh, true positive rate 0.4 and uh, false positive rate is, is, is very small. So for this one, it's if you don't want like false alarms, um, that's where the, 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 that's the type of algorithm you want to, to select. But at the same time, if you pick up this algorithm, it actually has a very high um, you know, true positive rate but also pretty high false positive rate. So you know, if it is a you know, car alarm, you're gonna be waking up a lot at night because it will create your sort of false alarm, but it will be very, very sensitive. So um, that actually tells you about sort of sensitivity of the algorithm. And the perfect algorithm will have, of course, 100% um, or 1.0 true positive rate. So it will pick up all the, you know, sort of all, all the prediction, you know, it will, it will catch all the potential, you know, events, but it will never uh, create a false alarm. Now, if you pick up an algorithm on the diagonal where your false positives and, and true positive are equal, it's really a sort of random guess because you know it's equally well uh, with equal probability uh, tells you that that uh, uh, the event is going to happen on or not. And so this allows us to look at the algorithm on this in this space, and the space has called ROC space. And we're going to talk about it in a second. Before getting there, uh, let's also try to visualize and understand, um, you know, the, this notion of um, positive, negative, you know, what it looks like from the point of view of, of um, actual distribution of the examples. So notice, and again, I, I, as I mentioned before, the challenge here is that, and we're going back to the example of logistic regression, is that we do have some, you know, data points, right? We have some regions where we have some sort of contradictory evidences, right? In a sense that, um, you know, for the for for these data points, it's very clear that this is, you know, the sort of the, the example the example of failing, right? You have you, you didn't study a lot, you failed. And these guys are a very clear example of, of succeeding. But in between, there is sort of, you know, contradicting arguments because you have, you know, some examples where there is a lot of hours and, and you know, the person fails. And then there are examples when there are a few hours and the person succeeds. And so you kind of, those classes, 
if you think about this being two classes, right? Class, uh, you know, positive and class negative, they are, they're, they're overlapping in terms of their evidences, right? And so you can actually visualize this the following way. Um, if we put on the um, x-axis, we, we put the score from the classifier, um, then um, what we get is we, we can look into the distribution of, of data points, right, based on the uh, classifier score. And uh, that's our sort of, you know, evidence, if you wish. And um, then um, when we set up a classifier um, by selecting a particular location of the threshold, we're looking into, into it, we, we are splitting this um, into to sort of two hubs, right? And uh, for positive examples, those that we call positive, and according to our classifier, this is, for example, will be, you know, whatever is above the threshold, um, that's uh, positive examples. And if we call them positive and they're really positive, we call them true positive. And of course, we call something negative, it's true negative. But then those parts that overlap that's what we get, you know, false positive and, and false negatives. Um, I want to show you one visualization which might be helpful uh, in, in understanding this. Um, honestly, myself, um, you know, it, it takes some time to, to kind of understand how this, how, how this work and, and get used to it. But here's an idea again. What we do is um, we, on this, on this visualization, you kind of go go through all the data points, right? And um, for each data point, imagine that we we have this value, right? According to our model. So this is data point, this value, this data point, this value, this data point, this value. But data points are blue and and um, let me make it red for those again for those that are positive examples and. Um, blue for those that corresponds to negative examples. And see, there is a part where we have only, you know, blue points, there are parts where there are only red points, and there are parts when there is a mixture of blue and red points. And so if we, for example, put our threshold here, um, and say on right is everybody positive class, it will be correct for these points, uh, but you know we punish this 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 interval where we still have some uh, you know red points. Um, at the same time, if we put threshold somewhere here, we correctly guessed all those guys that fail because there is only blue points here. But we will make mistake uh, with these guys because there are some blue points and some red points. And I'm trying to visualize this a little bit more. Um, again, think about it. Um, like going along this line. Uh, here they are sorted, our, our examples. And uh, you, you realize that because of, of uh, you know, the sort of contradicting evidences a little bit, um, we have a part which is mixed. And then that's what sort of where we have, if there are true positives on the right, right? Then and we put a threshold here, which means you know everything about threshold we consider positive, and everything below a threshold we consider negative. Then um, these guys that are in fact positives, you know, we classify them within the threshold as negatives, and so they're becoming false negatives. And if I move the threshold somewhere here, that will change um, the balance. Okay, I know this is a lot, um, and you know this takes some time to get used to it. Uh, bear with me for a few more minutes. Um, you know, this, this 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 is probably the most difficult part of of the course um, in how to understand those classifiers. So, what I was trying to say is that depending on the threshold, depending on how you put where you put the threshold, you can actually you know get very different confusion matrices, because depending on the threshold, um, you get uh, different points being, you know, correctly or incorrectly classified. So when we move, when we're moving threshold, 
you know, from, from here to next point, to next point, to next point, to next point, um, we are changing the way that our classifier operates, right? So the model itself gives us this function, the probability distribution, but at the end, if we want two classes, we also need to find out the correct position for this threshold. And depending on where we put the threshold, we get very, very different uh, matrices, very different confusion matrices, and very different performance of our um, classifier. So looking at this picture and sort of shifting, you know, the threshold, you can actually build on our um, ROC space, right, on our diagram of false positive against um, true positive, you can build what's called ROC curve. And ROC curve really means this is a curve along which you can actually have your classifier perform. Depending on where you put your threshold, your classifier, exactly the same classifier, the same model, can uh, work either and have like, um, you know, to, uh, low true positive and, and low false positive rates, or for example, can have um, high true positive and, and higher false positive rates. So you can think about moving along this curve and, and shifting the threshold here as a, um, changing the sensitivity of your alarm, right? The more uh, sensitive your alarm is, um, the, the more events you will capture, but the more sensitive it is, the more often it will be triggered uh, by, uh, you know, the wrong events. So it's not going to be, you know, true alarm, it's going to be a false alarm. And so you can actually take exactly the same model and by shifting the threshold, you can make it operate in a different regimes, right? By shifting threshold on, we, on when you call um, a result positive or negative, um, you can actually move along this line. And so every classifier has its own sort of trajectory, has its own line, has its own ROC curve. And on different parts of this ROC curve, the positioning on that ROC curve depends on um, your sensitivity threshold that the way you move it um, through the data. And so the job for you as a data scientist is to find out the optimal position for this threshold, which is find on this ROC curve, the optimal um, you know, operating point of your classifier. And so that's why it operates along this curve. And so you want to actually fix particular values um, of false positive to positive rate that is optimal for your problem. And, and this is an example of uh, such a you know, classifier or of such ROC curve that is built for some particular data set. It does look very jigged because um, you, know, you, you shift um, the values um, on the data points. And so you, you know, you're gonna get those step um, like functions. Now, to end up on this story, um, the quality of the classifier is actually can be measured by the distance in between this curve and the diagonal. And the larger this area, the larger this area, the better is your classifier. So the classifier that's shown um, here is better than, for example, the one that has this ROC curve, um, but worse than, than this one. And the best one, of course, will be this classifier that, you know, at this point. So, um, that is, uh, you know, the way you measure it. Um, and, and the area typically, you know, you can either measure it to the diagonal or measure it like, you know, all the way through. Um, it, 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 it sort of does matter because, you know, the area and the triangle stays, you know, constant and it's one half. So by looking at ROC curves, um, there are two things to remember. Uh, one is sort of the further it is out, the better is the classifier and then classifier can operate along you know, different points of this curve and job of the data scientist, not only to build the model, but find out that spot on this curve at which your classifier is gonna operate. Um, 
quite often in business, instead of looking at this ROC curves, uh, people look at lift curves. Uh, lift curves is, uh, you know, it's, it, it's an advantage of, uh, you know, results compared to random guessing. From this curve, you can actually easily um, calculate lift curve and, you know, at the seminar, we'll look at uh, how it can be done. So um, that was sort of a very quick overview of uh, the, the supervised learning uh, models and uh, you know, the, the very important part of it, which is their um, way to evaluate classifiers. Now we're gonna get back for a minute to the customer churn modeling. Um, and then we'll connect it to this, to our sort of, to our uh, classifying classifiers. So imagine that you have new customers and, uh, you know, they're coming in and you have a large customer base um, of, of active customers, right? So here it is, you're all active customers. Then um, what our churn model should do is to predict if the customer is gonna leave, right? And so um, what are the options? Well, um, you can have true positives, right? Remember that, you know, two by two matrix. So you have true positive, those are actual churners and um, that will be sort of our outflow. Then we'll, then we'll predict um, um, non-churners, like actual non-churners, right? Those that sort of stays with our customer base. And this is true positives and this is true negatives, right? True, true positives, true negatives. This is when the model is, is, is correct. And then our model will make mistakes. Um, it will actually predict that somebody's gonna churn, but they're not gonna churn. And they're actually in fact like active customers. And then it will miss that somebody's gonna churn, but, uh, that they will churn out, right? And so overall, the customers that are gonna leave are those that we predict are gonna leave and those that we missed. So we said they're not gonna leave, but they leave, right? So it's true positive and false negatives. Now, for each of these um, predictions, you know, the predictions, the value of the prediction is that the, the uh, operator can act based on those predictions. And for example, give a discount to customers. So then um, the question is, okay, what is the cost for the operator? Um, if the operator gives this, and let's say, you know, discounts are effective. Let's say, you know, when you give the discount um, or like 80% effective, whatever. Um, but when you give a discount, um, it changes the behavior. So when you give discount to actual churners, that's money well spent, right? So they can, for example, you know, save um, the person from churning, from churning right? Um, so this is money well spent. But when you give discount to those guys that we predict they're going to churn, right? But they're not churn, so false positives when we give discount to this group of people, then we literally just wasted that discount money because the customers were not going to, were not going to churn anyway, but we give them some discounts, right? So we wasted some money. And, um, you know, when we predicted actual non-churners and they didn't churn, okay, good. But then when we predicted that somebody's going to, not going to churn, but they, they, they do churn. So we have like false negatives. Then, this is a problem, big problem, because here, depending on customer LTV, right, we could learn a lot of money um, that we could have earned from that customers if they stayed. So then the question is, we need somehow to balance, um, you know, on one hand, we want to keep the customers, right? Um, on the other hand, of course, we don't want to provide um, a lot of money, you know, to, to, to spend a lot of money on discounts and especially give it the discount to everybody. So if our model is really bad and it creates, you know, misses actual churners, it creates a lot of 
uh, predict a lot of churners that are not churners, then we're going to be wasting money. We're going to be wasting money here, and we're going to be losing money here. And so based on that, you can actually um, try to tune your model, right? And this is done through so-called profit curves. When we take um, our ROC curve, which tells us the model performance, right? The, 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 the quality of the model that we can achieve. And um, we can, see, remember, we can tune up the sensitivity of the model, right? And the more, the more sensitive model, the better it can detect those customers that will churn, but it also will increase the false alarms, which is it will you know, say the customer is gonna churn to those who are not gonna churn. And so that will also cost money. And so you can actually, for each of the potential um, sort of uh, points of, 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 of problems, right? For each of those uh, false negatives and, 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 and false positives, you can actually um, assign some you know, dollar value, actual dollar value to them. And then uh, you can actually calculate estimated gain or loss due to the model based on uh, you know, mistakes or based on uh, the rate of true positive versus false positives. And that will allow you to, depending on the model parameters and hence depending on uh, you know, the positioning along um, the ROC curve, you can build so-called profit curve where for each, um, you know, for, each, uh, for, for, for each position on ROC curve, you can actually calculate uh, you know, positive or negative uh, profit. And so, you know, in some sense, then you can calculate it for um, the entire um, set of, of, of customers. And if you can figure out at which position you can get maximum profit. So it's not only the fact, you know, how well um, your model performs, but it's a combination of your cost structure and uh, model performance. And based on that, you can actually select um, that point on ROC curve where your model should operate at. All right, I know that's that's a lot uh, to to sort of um, process. Um, with that, I think we're going to be um, done today. Uh, there is one more book um, if you're interested in, in in going in depth in this type of topic, which is called applied predictive modeling, and then on actually on um, uh, or both ranking classifier and uh, understanding of confusion matrix and ROC curves. Um, there is a very good chapter in the book, Data Science for Business. Um, so strongly recommend to read that. Now, again, this is a very complicated and you know, confusing topic if you're seeing it for the first time. So I would recommend you going slowly through this and uh, you know, during the exercise, you will have a chance to try this but it is extremely important um, to understand how this works um, because you know, a lot, a lot of practical um, data science problems that we deal with, they are, first of all, unbalanced in terms of the classes, right? So we are looking to detect uh, you know, events with, with, when the classes, the training classes are very unbalanced. And second, um, you know, the same sort of the same model trained on the same data um, the same model can perform very, very differently dep depending on uh, uh, the sort of threshold that we select, the, 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 the sensitivity of the model. And uh, um, the way to choose the right sensitivity is by looking at the business consequences um, of the operating of this model. And that would allow you to choose optimal um, operating parameters for the model um, that is coming from business. Okay, with that, um, I'm done. Um, any questions, please? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, could yeah. you please come to the classification algorithm? I didn't really understand the difference between uh, binary and multi-class classification. Oh, binary multi-class, um, the difference, just give me one second. Um, well, 
I don't know why, by some reason it's not. Uh, just one sec. Okay, so uh, binary classification is when you have two possible classes, right? You classifying say cats versus dogs based on, I don't know, pictures, right? And multi-class classification is when you have multiple target classes. For example, you have class of dogs, of cats, of zebras, of elephants. And so um, then you separate them in, in, in multiple classes. Or if we look at say, um, you know, example with, with the points here, here we have like two classes, you know, um, red points and blue points. And let's say we have an example here, like one group of points, um, then there is, say, you know, another group of points, and then say, you know, another group of points. So there were really three classes, right? Red, green, green, and blue. And we want our algorithm to separate the results into three groups, three classes. So that's the difference. Uh, okay, I understand. Thank you. And uh, then the results will be, what does it mean, like class uh, segmentation? Uh, uh, what does it mean, like class and probability or, or score ranking? Oh, probability of score. Of score, this means, um, like we discussed before, you can have a sort of hard assignment saying, like, okay, you know, the this item is really, you know, this picture is a dog or this picture is a cat. Or we can have a um, score or probability that this item, like when your algorithm is not very confident, um, you can say, okay, this is 80%. We, we think it, you know, it's a dog with a probability 80%, right? Or we think it's a cat with a probability 30%, um, or it's a 50-50, right? And you as a designer, of, of the algorithm have to decide where the threshold is. If it is a probability, the reasonable threshold of course is 50%. But if it is not a probability, but some sort of score, we cannot always have a probability in, in, in those type of algorithms. Then you can say, okay, well, depending you know, on the score, we, we, we put it into you know, one class. It's easier to understand on, on sort of the binary classification. Um, so the same way it, it, it's we, when we looked at this picture um, right now here, uh, you know, if you have a data point, let's say you have a data point, you know, this is, a, uh, this is the algorithm that we trained and you have a new data point, you know that somebody has been studying for two and a half hours, right? That's your data point. Your model then predicts that the probability of somebody passing an exam is 30%, okay? And that's what it means, you know, the, 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 the probability. We're not saying that somebody is gonna pass or fail, we're saying it's 30%. Mm -hmm. But then it's up to you as a designer of this is to, if, if, you know, ultimately somebody wants to like know, okay, if it's gonna pass or not, you can say, okay, look, I'm putting a threshold on passing the test at 50%, for example, right? Or you can say, you know what? I will decide that you're gonna pass um, the, you know, the exam if the probability is about 25%. Yeah. That's your decision as a, as a data scientist, right? And uh, yeah, then you call it, okay, everything is about 25%, you know, I believe it's gonna pass. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Okay, I get it. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, sure. And again, guys, the, the sort of the part with confusion matrix and, and the ROC curves, that is very challenging, very difficult part. Um, I'm, you know, I'm always not sure if, if, if uh, you want to teach it, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's important to learn that in order, if you want to actually in depth understand how those algorithm works and how they, how they evaluate it, because in some sense, for you as a user, it's not that important to understand what's inside the box, but it's important to understand how you evaluate the performance of that black box, right? And, and the confusion matrix is the way to evaluate it. 
So, you know, it, but it will take, you know, it will take some time to get used to, to, to that, to this metric metrics. All right, okay. No more questions, then we're done for today. Thank you very much. And uh, um, so there much. is a seminar I think already started.